How can godly women work in the world? The topic that Pat will be using today. Pat is the wife of Glenn Searles and the mother of two sons. She has a BA in education from OCC, has done graduate work at East Texas State University, taught in the Dallas schools, and has taught ladies and girls classes for which we know her best, and has spoken on a number of lectureships and ladies day programs. Uh, we have learned to love and appreciate Pat very much here at Brown Trail, and she has, of course, spoken on our lectureship previously, and we couldn't think of anyone who could do a better job with this topic today than Pat Searles. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today and to see some friends that I haven't seen in years and to see uh, the special friends from Mayfield Road that came today. I'm fixing to decrease my height about two inches, so don't panic. <laughs> I fell yesterday and hurt my knee. <laughs> so if I'm good stand up here for 35 or 40 minutes, I'm going to have to have my feet flat. Uh, my mother is with me today and has Parkinson's disease and falls all the time. And I'm always teasing her. But yesterday it was my turn. And she said, well, I wondered where you went. I walked around behind the car and fell. <laughs> she said, well, I thought you ran into somebody you knew and was talking or something. I said, no, I was kissing the pavement, mother. <laughs> But anyway, it's all right. It's just a little stiff. But I do have a wonderful husband and two beautiful children that I'm willing to discuss with you at any time you want to. Um, I, that's a joke between Susie and I, showing our kids pictures at lectureships. But it is a pleasure to be here. When I uh, got the letter in the mail giving me my topic, uh, and it said, can you know, godly women work in the world? I thought I was kind of like Mike White the first morning he did his lecture. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the answer to that is yes, but you can't talk on yes for 35 minutes. So we're going to discuss some uh, reasons for godly women working in the world and, and some things they're up against and God's plan for them and, and some other women who have done it effectively that we know about. But before we do, would you bow with me, please? Economy the way it is nowadays. Uh, it is just getting more and more common that women have to work. I used to have such a firm stand against working mothers that I was really unmovable about it. And I still am on a certain issue. I do not believe young women can work for luxuries and can justify it with scriptures. I just don't think they can do that. I think God intended for us to be keepers at home, and I think that's what we're supposed to be. But with the economy the way it is, and people being laid off, and I don't know how it's hit y'all's congregations, but at Mayfield Road, with GM laying off so many, it's hit our congregation hard. Uh, more and more places, more and more of our people in the congregation in the oil industry are losing their jobs. And the ones that aren't losing their jobs are getting their hours cut way back. And you go from a 40-hour week to a 30-hour week, and you have to have help putting food on the table sometimes. Now, to me, the good solution for that would be if mother could find a part-time job while junior's at school. But sometimes that's not always possible. So we need to learn that there are some things we can do to remain godly and faithful and spiritual and growing and still work in the world. More and more women are saying, should I get a job? You know, should I do that? Should I leave the home? Will God be pleased if I do? It is a hard decision. It is hard, especially for those that have stayed home with children for, for years. There are certain criteria that I think every woman needs to understand that it is a full-time job to raise children and especially the mothers that are here on their lunch hour like several told me they were last year you know how hard it is to work outside the home and to be a keeper at home and to get that laundry done and to get those kids in bed on time and to listen to that little kid read that reader and check that homework and it's hard it is hard Mothering is a full-time job, and when you put a mother outside the home, she's got two full-time jobs. Two full-time jobs. It wears on you emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually 
if you let it. That's what we want to talk about today. Children are just like sponges. They absorb everything around them. They absorb attitudes, ideas, beliefs. So you want to make sure that that job is a necessity, not a luxury, because you don't want them absorbing the attitudes, ideas, and beliefs of a daycare center worker or a babysitter. You want them to have spiritual, scriptural beliefs of a godly mother. So that is, to me, the main thing you consider when you say, I really need to get a job, but I don't know what to do. You really need to ask yourself, is it truly a necessity or a luxury? A young woman called me. In fact, it wasn't long after I started working on this lecture last spring, and she said, I've always stayed at home. She has three beautiful children. She said, but my husband has asked me to go to work. What do I do? What do I do? I feel like I can't leave the home. But he's asked me to help out. He just can't make ends meet anymore. But he thinks it's going to be temporary. Well, that's beautiful. Uh, a temporary situation. There are just times when our honeys need help. Uh, we have a couple of women at church that do in-home work. We have several women who keep children. There are ways to make money. There are ways to help out. So you find out all of that first. Well, when you've decided you need to work, that it's a necessity, that you're a Christian woman and know your first obligation is to your family and you need to be home, but it's a necessity, what do you do? What kind of job, what type of job do you go for? Well, obviously, you don't work in a bar, and you don't work in a disco. But let me tell you something else I don't think Christians do, and that's being an airline stewardess serving drinks on a plane. What's the difference? A real good friend of mine that I've known and loved since I was in high school called me a couple of years ago, and she said, I can't be a stewardess anymore. I've refused to serve drinks for so many years that they've now called me on the carpet. I either serve the drinks or I quit my job. And I said, well, to me, you don't have a choice. She said, you mean give in and serve the drinks? And I said, well, no, quit your job. <laughs> you know, to me, that's like working at a bar. Serving a drink is serving a drink. And she got a beautiful job as the secretary of the company, making more than she ever did, so she's doing great. See, God takes care of you. You stand up for him, and he'll stand up for you. I believe there's three questions that every Christian should ask herself before she accepts a position. And you never know when you may be in this position to work. You just don't know when a horrible accident can happen and take your husband's health. It happened in this congregation just a couple of years ago. Um, you just don't know what tomorrow brings. You just don't know when you may become a single parent the sole support of your kids. So I think it's something we all need to think about and be prepared for. Number one to me foremost is, will this job allow me to keep God first in my life? Can I, can I stay with God being number one? Can I keep him first? If not, look for another one. Don't accept that one. A young man at church is just precious. We have all gotten so attached to him, and we're all just kind of upset because he's getting married now. Just the cutest little blonde, but he's getting married this summer. He's going to get snagged. Cutest little thing. And he told me one time, spiritual young man for 26 years old. I mean godly, Christian, fine young man. Told me that he went to job application after job application after job application just trying to find somebody that let him stay off on Wednesday night so he could come to church. How many young people think about that today? Well, they think as long as they come Sunday morning, take communion, they've done their dues for the week. And he was worried about missing Wednesday night while I hugged him and kissed him. Isn't that fervent? <laughs> but isn't that the way we want our children and our grandchildren to be? Gung-ho for the Lord, not to miss a single opportunity to be there and worship Him? 
Will this job take me away from my family too much? Number two. I have a real good friend that uh, was just scared to death to go on her job interview. And she was a graduate, college graduate, and had taught school for a couple of years. Then when she had her children, she stayed home like I did. And, and uh, her husband got laid off, and he was, oh, goodness, out of a job for about eight or nine months. And she got a super opportunity just dropped in her lap for this job. She was only there like three months when all of a sudden she just kept getting promotion after promotion after promotion. Because you see, Christians are the best employees. I mean, they give you a nine-hour work day for eight hours pay. They don't watch the clock. They're just wonderful, aren't they? Well, they should be. She was and just kept getting promoted. But each promotion called for travel. But she kept thinking, with each promotion, and if they call him back from the layoff, all the back bills will be caught up, and I won't have to work anymore. So she kept taking each promotion. See, see how the devil just snuck it up there just a little higher and a little higher and a little bit more money and a little bit more money until she was up there fourth under the president of that corporation, traveling all over these United States representing that company, money hand over fist, and her husband was staying home with the children. Now, in that role reversal, that's not healthy. And all of a sudden, one night, she said, it just hit her. This isn't what I want to do. She was packing her bags to hit an airplane early the next morning. Her husband was going to take her to the airport and kiss her goodbye one more time. And she thought, you know, I should be kissing him goodbye. And he needs to be getting on that plane. You are not going to believe this. But she went and told her boss how wonderful her husband was, how efficient he was, and he got the job. <laughs> now, you think that isn't the Lord answering prayer? Now, I know that's rare, and I, it sounds like I could write a Harlequin romance, doesn't it? <laughs> but I tell you what, prayer is answered. You pray fervently enough. And that's, that was role reversal. They just switched right back. Try as much as possible to maintain a normal family life with mother and father both together. A lot of couples try to save money by mother trying to work in the evenings after dad comes home and she'll try to get a little job somewhere and work evening hours so dad can stay home with the kids and therefore save babysitting money. For a brief period of time, that's all right. But psychiatrists have proven over an extended period of time that is not healthy. And you say, oh, sure it is. They're at least with a parent and not with a babysitter or a stranger. No. For an extended period of time, they are not seeing mother and father together interacting. They are not seeing the family together interacting as a family. They're either seeing mother part of the time and dad part of the time, but there's not a time, no matter how few hours it is, that they are a family. See what I'm saying? And psychiatrists say over an extended period of time, that is not healthy. There's no interaction between mother and father. There's no married family role for them to form on how they should be when they're older. So for a small period of time, that's fine. If not, they, they just develop a misconception of the total family picture. It's just not healthy over an extended period of time. Even if you do have to work, spend as much time with your children in the evening as you can. Keep up the secure snuggling, say your prayer times, no matter uh, what their ages are. This keeps the emotional and spiritual training as an important part of their day. Proverbs 22, 6. No matter how tired you are, and this is the bad part about working mothers, you're a wife and mother first, then you're an employee. Don't let that job ever come before the well-being of your family, not just physically, but emotionally as well. Third, ask yourself, is this job going to require me to compromise God's standards? Both of these examples I'm going to give you are personal examples that women have come to me and told me. Right is right, wrong is wrong. A young woman came to me and found out her employer scales weighed six to eight ounces heavy. And when she approached him and said... We need to have these scales checked, he snickered. He knew they'd weighed heavy for years. 
And she said, well, that's cheating them of six to eight ounces of goods. And he said, if you can't handle it, quit. So she quit. Dishonesty is dishonesty. Another young woman told me her boss had her falsify some expenditure, some accounts where he traveled. And she did it. And she said for several nights, she just flat couldn't sleep. She said she tossed and she turned and she knew better. But he was her boss and he told her to do it. And she said finally, she just went to him the next morning, asked him for his forgiveness for allowing him to pressure her into doing that and then turned in her resignation. God provided and she got another job that paid us, uh, it, well, just about as much, just a little bit less. But God took care of her because she had better hours and more time at home with her children. God will take care of you if that job is a necessity. If that job is keeping you in ruffles and lace, it may not work out. But if that job is keeping food on your table and allergy medicine in your baby, it's going to work out. God is going to provide for his people. He's going to take care of us. Pitfalls to avoid on the job. I think once we realize that Christianity is a way of life, it's not just something you wake up on Sunday morning and get a spiritual attitude and turn on a channel and watch a show and get a spiritual attitude and, and try to sing a hymn as you walk around. Why can't you do that every morning? It's not a coat you put on on Sunday and Wednesday night. Christianity is a way of life and if you teach junior children and high school children and girls classes, this is something that needs to be number one, the attitude you need to, to get across to them in their formative years. Christianity is a way of life we are a Christian. I am a female next. I am an American next. I'm a wife, mother, but I am a Christian first. That is what I am. I think I've got a little French and German blood, but I'm Christian first. Everybody seems to think Christian is your religion. You know, what you do with your spiritual part of you. No, Christian is what you are. Total. That's what you are. You are a Christian. I'll never forget the little boy when the teacher asked him what nationality he was. He said Christian. That's true. Now, she really, the kids were talking about the Indians and the pilgrims, and she wanted him to say what nationality he was, but he was a Christian. And she kind of chuckled. And, but that, that's a cute answer. We are Christian first. If we realize we're Christian, then we don't have to worry about how the people at the work are going to affect us or how the women in PTA are going to affect us or how the women on the committee that we're on at the hospital auxiliary are going to affect us. If we're Christian first, no matter what we're doing, aren't we going to handle it? We talked last year, remember, the huge circle. Everybody's life is a huge pie. And we call it your personality circle. It's divided into three parts. Your personal, uh, your public, your private, and your personal. Your public life is what everybody sees. Your private life is what you allow your family and close friends to see. Your personal life is what only you and God know. <coughs> If you and God have it worked out, then all the rest of that circle is going to fall into place. Because if your personal relationship is with God what it's supposed to be, then all the rest of your relationships are what they're going to be. If you and God have it worked out, then you and your neighbor don't have problems. You and your husband don't have too many. You don't yank your children's hair out too often. You know, if you have it together, then the rest of your life just kind of fits into place. Christians are not perfect. They're forgiven. We don't go around walking on little fleecy clouds with no problems at all. We have the same problems the world has, but we handle them differently. We don't panic. We don't fall apart. 
We don't cry and smote our breast and, you know, sackcloth and ashes. However, there are times I think we need to sometimes it fast a couple of days. But we handle our problems differently. So that's what I tell young working mothers when they come to me just so upset. I have to get a job. What do I do? Be a Christian. Find a job you can handle and still be a Christian and not give up your Bible school class you teach and not give up your quality time with your children hugging and, and squeezing and cuddling at night. And the laundry and things will work out. They'll usually work out. You can sneak a load in one night, put it in the dryer before you go to work the next morning. You know, that'll handle itself. You know, people will wear clean clothes eventually. So the clothes will take care of themselves. Whatever you are, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, if you have the mental attitude that I am a Christian, it's going to work out. If you're extremely fortunate and work with members of the large church, uh, that's wonderful. But most people work in the world. They work with the ungodly. However, I think sometimes the worst hurts in the world are when um, members of the church hurt each other. You know, you expect it from the world. They're heathen. You just kind of expect them to make boo-boos and say things. And But what you have to remember if you work with Christians is that they're human too. They're going to make mistakes, and they're not always going to handle it just the best way they could have. But you still ought to have the ability to go to each other as Christian sisters or sister and brother and say, I'm sorry, can we start over? Can we, can we have a replay of that and do it differently this time? I, I loved teaching at Christian schools for that reason. We weren't without our problems, but we could each go to each other and work it out. It was so much better than teaching in public school. One of the things we have to remember when working in the world is that even though they're kind and good people, and you may love the women you work with, their frame of reference is not spiritual. They're not God's children. And the number one pitfall that most young women that I've observed when they go into the workforce in the world, the pitfall that catches them nearly every time is don't ask advice from ungodly people. I can bring four marriages of prominent Christian people to mind just like that. Where it was a necessity for the young girl to go to work. And especially the young girls that have never worked before and all they've ever done was stay home with the babies. And their frame of reference is, you know how the world tries to make you feel. Oh, you mean you've just been a housewife before? Oh, I see. You don't have any previous experience. Oh, I'll tell you what, being a chauffeur and a nurse and a laundry assistant and a cook, uh, housewives have a lot of experience they can handle on a job efficiency. How many people can get up at 3 a.m., give a kid a bottle, get it back to bed, get back to bed, get up and answer the alarm at 6? I don't know many men that can do that. My husband snored right through it all the time. Housewives were doing the most important job in the world, re rearing their babies. Yes, you have experience to offer. You have mature experience. You have a Christian attitude, a positiveness to add to that corporation. Yes, you've got experience. It may not be exactly the kind they had in mind, but you learn fast. How many people adapt faster than a mother? You hand a new sweet little thing, that baby, and put it in her arms when she's in the hospital, and she goes, what do I do now? And you see her six weeks later while she slaps that baby on the bed, gets that diaper on, pokes that bottle in its mouth, burps it. Don't we adapt? Well, sure. We learn fast. We adapt. But seeking advice from ungodly people seems to be a big pitfall because when young girls come out of the home in the secure home atmosphere, they go into these corporations and they see these executive type women. I mean, the women that have it all together. I mean, everything matches. The eyeshadow, the lipstick, the blouse, coordinates with the hose and the skirt. And, the, and if she bends over her slip, matches everything, you know. I mean, have it together. They have an air of efficiency that young girls go goo-goo over. 
and they tend to equate that with she has all the answers and she may be one of the best most efficient people she you've ever seen at that job but she's still not a Christian and can't give you spiritual godly advice on a Christian issue so if you and your precious little husband have a spat that morning you don't ask that three-time married woman what to do about it you know what her answer is going to be honey you need to find somebody that you can get along with better well, I just wouldn't put up with that. Well, I'd be a nervous wreck if I started off every day like that. Well, honey, she started off three different times like that. <laughs> you don't ask ungodly for spiritual advice. All four little couples that I can think of right now ended in divorce because of that one thing. That's sad. Split up little families. Children had to be torn apart. Some of the children went with just one of them. A couple of the families broke them up, and Mom and Dad each took one, and my goodness. So be careful. That's a pitfall. David warns about this very thing. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the way of sinners, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Don't seek advice from non-Christians. Seek out somebody, and if you don't want it to be your mother, if it's something you can't discuss with your mother, I can't imagine what I couldn't discuss with my mother. I've told her some pretty raunchy things, having a mom. My mother's here. She's precious. Uh, but if you can't, find a godly woman in the church that you can talk to. Ask her if you can just come over one afternoon and talk to her. And I bet, I bet it won't shock her. Well, I bet her honey probably did that to her one time. Uh, I just can't imagine anything that'd shock anybody except the young girl that did come to me and tell me she discovered her husband was a homosexual and living with one of the students he was tutoring. That did make my mouth fly open. I will admit that. Christians seek their wisdom from God and from experienced Christians who've lived there and been there before. The worldly woman just doesn't think in the realm of the spiritual. Therefore, her advice is not spiritual and will not teach you to be spiritual. Secondly, when you're working, don't become too closely associated with the ungodly. Don't make them your closest friends. Um, that's hard sometimes, especially when you find out your husbands have things in common. You know, it's easy. Most women can get just about get along with anybody. But you know, sometimes it's hard to find somebody your husband can get along with that you like it equally as well. You know, personalities are just different. It doesn't mean they're not good people, and it doesn't mean they're not fun to be with. But you don't want your husband sitting over in the corner all night watching everybody talk and nodding. You want him to find somebody he can interact with. And sometimes in the working world, I was thinking of one, one of these little couples that divorced, incidentally. This is one of the pitfalls they got into. Uh, she not only sought advice from this woman, but found out their husbands had golf and hunting in common. And they start seeing them a lot on the weekend. When you start seeing people, and even though you don't participate in their beer at the lake and in the fishing boat and on the hunting trips, it starts becoming not so <clears throat> to you anymore after you've seen it several times. The first time they pop a top off a can of beer, you go, oh, I didn't know y'all drank. Oh, it's, it, does it offend you? Yes. They don't usually say that. They say, oh, well, no, no, uh, we brought Cokes. And pretty soon, about the fifth or sixth time you're with them and they pop the tops and they're just getting so rowdy and happy, it just rolls off your back. See how you just become desensitized to the world? Gone with the Wind aired on television Sunday night and Tuesday night. Remember when that was the scandal of the movie industry because he said, Scarlett, I don't give up. <clears throat> you hear that on TV all the time now on commercials, don't you? Well, wow, that's just one of the mildest words on TV now. We're desensitized. When I was growing up, and even when I was in college, and my goodness, I'm not that old. I won't even be 40 till May. Uh, we didn't even wear slacks to school. 
Look what they wear now. Look how they dress. We're desensitized. Uh, look what's on television. Used to, on the little Doris Day movies, you know, she and James Garner or Rock Hudson had twin beds. Uh-uh. And she had on a negligee with a little house, little uh, coat thing over the top of it. Uh-uh. Now they're nude in one bed, and sometimes we're lucky if there's a sheet on top of them. But let me tell you what, the TV has an on and off button. Nighttime soaps are a disgrace, and if you watch them in your home, please pray about it. If you've got children in your home and you watch those nighttime soaps, I beg you to reconsider and to pray about it. We are so desensitized to error. Even though the non-Christian is cute and sweet and witty and fun to be with type person, her affections are not on things above, and she's not going to edify you, Colossians 3, 2, and she's not going to help you set your mind on things above, and she's not going to help you be stronger. Make your closest friends Christian friends. She will not assist you in having the mind of Christ, Philippians 2, 5, or in acquiring the fruits of the Spirit, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 10. Thirdly, try to avoid picking up habits of the ungodly. Don't join in their joke sessions, no matter how mildly amused they are. Don't even pick up their slang expressions. And after you've heard them so many times, one of the main things you have to do is when you hear something over and over daily, every time you have to hear it, say a quick prayer and say, God, please forgive them and help them learn that's wrong. It has to be a mental attitude you have. Because if it isn't, you're going to eventually become desensitized to hearing that. Uh, I have a friend that works in an office, and she's the only Christian in the office, and there's five or six ladies in there with her. They love to shock her. Love to shock her. And I told her, she called me one night, was telling me about it, and I said, next time they tell a joke, get up and excuse yourself and go to the bathroom. So she started doing that. And I said, when you go to the bathroom, powder your nose, tinkle, whatever you've got to do, but pray for them while you're in there. Keep your mind on the fact that that's wrong. And remind yourself why you left the room. But while you're out of the room, pray for them. Uh, you know, smut used to be something that everybody laughed and joked about and said, oh, he must be a sailor. Now everybody does it. I work two days a week at the little elementary school, and you can't believe what comes out of those first graders' mouths. And I guarantee you they got it either at the daycare center or from mom and daddy. They don't learn it on their own. And it flows forth. But you need to mentally register it as error every time it occurs and pray for them. Don't ever get to the point where you accept it. I still get so upset at movies where they think they have to throw these words in to get a PG rating so more people will come see it. And it could be just a real decent, cute little movie, but just so it doesn't get a G rating so everybody will think it's not Disney movie, they throw in these expletives so it'll get a PG rating. It just makes me sick. That doesn't say much for our society, does it? Fourthly, when you, if you have to work, don't fall into the pitfall or the devil's snare of loving money and the power of money and the power of position. You know, the purchasing power of money is a very real thing. But it seems like the more you have, the more you won't. And the more you have, the more there seems that's out there for you to buy. You know, the perfect example is when you don't work, this precious young couple, I just adore them. I've been in PTO, PTA with her for years. And she just got a job last year, and it's just doing real well. And they really did need her to go to work at first. Now she works because she likes it and gets her out of the house, and she has a housekeeper that comes in two days a week and does all her work. But they made it just fine on a little Volkswagen. Now they drive an LTD Crown Victoria that's payment is twice of what their house payment is. See what you do? It's still a vehicle with four wheels and a steering wheel that you put gas in. But see what you do? You up your standard, don't you? It's that power of what that money will buy. 
It's the status. You know who created status? Beelzebub. I know he did, and I think he created credit cards too. <laughs> I tell you, if you'll just remember, just like Paul told Timothy, the love of money is the root of all evil. It'll just get you to do all kinds of things. It'll get you in debt. It'll get you wanting more and more. But if you'll just remember that job is the means to an end, not your life. Christianity is your life. The job is just the means to an end. Fifth of all, don't slide into the pitfall of giving your job your all. Coming home so exhausted that your family gets the leftovers. I truly believe, and you've heard me say it if you've heard me ever, the mother sets the emotional tone for the family. I really believe she does. If mother's happy, it doesn't matter what an old bear dad is, the kids will laugh and say, boy, dad's grouchy day, isn't he? But if mama's grouchy, the kids go, <laughs> and slam a door. And You see, mother sets the emotional tone for the family. If the Christian is on the job and remains faithful and strong, it all goes back to mental attitude. How can some people work in the world and remain so strong and remain that faithful Bible school teacher and there at visitation and there at every work of the church and encourages her family to be there, never misses a night during a meeting at all the lectures? How can she do it and the other one always has a horrible headache and can't get supper on the table in time? I'm just a nervous wreck. Mental attitude. Mental attitude. Happiness is a state of mind. I know a godly woman that is 84 years old that has lost everything she had in the world twice. Once by a horrible storm and once by fire. She is precious. She didn't wring her hands and she didn't say, Oh, what are we going to do now? Because she knew the Lord was going to provide. And she had two boys to raise. It is mental attitude we can overcome. Christianity is not just something you put on like a coat. It is a day-to-day -day existence. A Christian is not a clock watcher. She's one of those people that the three little words apply to and then some. She's always willing to do whatever the boss wants her to that is Legal, scriptural, and non-fattening, preferably. But she's a willing, loyal employee. She's the salt of the earth and the light of the world. She's a godly example to anyone who knows her. She's efficient. She's happy. She's positive. She doesn't enter into office politics, nor does she ref pass on their gossip or listen to their jokes. You may be the only Bible that some people ever read. And if it is a necessity for you or your daughters to work in the world, encourage them to be the most read Bible that ever worked in that office or in that school. Because you don't know what an influence they could have on that person's life. A man told me just last year that when he was a professor at a state university, uh, he had a young man in one of his English classes, and he was a member of the church, and he said, that young man talked to me every chance he got, not verbally, but in his papers, in his themes. He always picked religious subjects to write on and put a lot of scripture in them. And he said, of course, to grade it for accuracy, I had to look the scriptures up. <laughs> he said, I was not baptized the year the young man was there. And he said, as a matter of fact, two years later, the young man was killed in a car accident. But he said, the death of that young man shook me so badly that I remembered all I had read on becoming a New Testament believer. And he said, I'm a member of the church today. And he knows. He knows I was baptized, but he said, I wrote and told his mom and dad that I am a Christian today because of their godly son in that state university. And, you know, we hear people say, oh, don't let your kid go to a state school. Or if they do, make sure it's got a Bible chair. If your child's been raised with a Christian attitude, now I know Christian schools are the best. I prefer them. Don't misunderstand me. I, I'd rather my child, he goes to Fort Worth Christian, as a matter of fact, I'd rather them be in a Christian atmosphere. 
But if you've raised them with the Christian attitude of Christianity is my life, not a code I put on or, on Sunday or Wednesday, it's going to work. It's going to work. Some people in the world just flaunt their promiscuous lives. I've known that. I worked one summer at, as a CPA at a, at a company when I was teaching school, and there was one woman that just had to tell it. I mean, just couldn't wait to tell it. She was married, but she was having an affair. And you can just listen to so much of that. And even though I wasn't listening, our walls were paper thin between our offices, and you could hear it. <laughs> this just, y'all are going to laugh. It is so dumb. I started taking cotton to work and putting it in my ears. <laughs> but you can't stand it after so long. You just can't take it. And the walls were paper thin, but you know, with the cotton, I could barely, every once in a while I'd take it out and say, I can't believe she said that. But, <laughs> but it does cause you to pray harder for them. It, you, it's just sickening. So I realize there are some people that, that do work in harder circumstances, but you just stand your ground against smut. And they will watch and see that you do. And don't compromise. Be prepared for the world. If you study and you have the equipment you need and study, other people have made it. Look at Hannah. Panana provoked her sorely about not having children. And it said that Hannah would cry and cry and cry and not be able to eat. But the Bible never says she riled or railed back at Panana. Not one time. You can't find one time where she fussed back at her. Look at Ruth. She gave up all she had to be with her mother-in-law. I went to a foreign country. Uh, knew nobody there except her mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law didn't really want her. She even changed her name to bitterness. Ruth could have said, yeah, you bitter old hag. I gave up everything I had to come with you. Now straighten up your attitude and stop pouting. I'm sick of it. Well, she could have. Did y'all see that movie on television the other night? Wasn't that terrible? tacky old woman to her poor little mother-in-law. It happens. But Ruth didn't. And every time I see this by William Barclay, I think of Ruth. William Barclay wrote, one of the highest of human duties is the duty of encouragement. It is easy to laugh at men's ideals. It's easy to pour cold water on enthusiasm. It's easy to discourage others. The world is full of discouragers. We have a Christian duty to encourage one another. Many a time a word of praise, or thanks, or appreciation, or cheer has kept a man on his feet. Blessed is the man who speaks such a word. Now, Paul, God through Paul, said in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore encourage one another. Build each other up just as you've also been doing. If there's a young girl in your congregation that you know has to work, encourage her because I guarantee you she's not getting it from the world. Build her up. Tell her what a good little mother she is and how cute her babies are. Tell her how sweet she is to be there faithfully at all the services. Encourage her and say, I admire you. Admire you for keeping up your church work and holding down a full-time job and being such a precious little mother. Build her up, encourage her, edify her, because I guarantee you there are nights she probably comes to church on Wednesday night with a migraine. Help her. It is our Christian duty to encourage each other. Look at Esther. She stood up for what she believed in. She didn't let people influence her, and she saved her nation. Look at, look at Abigail. She didn't work in the world, but she lived with a man that was something else. But her employees, her servants, knew her kind and her goodness, her understanding heart. And when things went wrong with David and his 400 men that were fixing to come swoop down on them, they came to her and said, help. And she fixed it. She fixed it by her goodly, godly good example. So you can be in evil surroundings and still be known for your goodness. Look at Priscilla. Paul said she's laid down her own neck for us and for the churches of the Gentiles in Romans 16, 3 through 5. She had the church meeting in her own house at a time when, if you were caught with a church in your house, that was it. 
She was known for her strength. Look at Lydia. She was a businesswoman. Her heart was opened by God's word, and even though she was a new convert, she wasn't scared off by the threats of the Romans in power. She stood for what she believed in evil surroundings. Mary, the mother of John Mark, same thing, stood firm. She was a haven for believers. They knew where to come. Who of us will ever be under the circumstances that these women were? We never know. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But in my opinion, especially to younger women, ridicule can be just as much a persecution as any physical persecution. It can be just as hard. Is the job really worth it? That's for you to decide. If it's a necessity, God bless you and stay strong. If it's a luxury, pray about it and rethink it. Remember, we can stand firm against the fiery darts of the devil. Your influence over the people at work may be the greatest influence that their life has ever had. And make sure your influence over them is greater than their influence over you. Remember, the job is just a means to an end. It's not your life. Christianity is your life. A careless word may kindle strife, a cruel word may wreck a life, a bitter word may hate and steal, a brutal word may smite and kill, a gracious word may smooth the way, a joyous word may light the day, a timely word may lessen stress, a loving word will heal and bless. Lord, may I touch someone with a soft caress, a soul who seeks your tenderness. Lord, let me speak in gentle tones to cheer someone who stands alone. Lord, let me work to plant your seed, bring forth harvest to meet the need of troubled soul who is nearby. Oh, tune my ears to hear the cry. I pray, O oh Lord, that I may be used to lift the fallen, love the bruised. There are souls adrift on troubled sea. Here I am, O oh Lord, send me. If your mission field is your job, God bless you.